A good friend of mine who I've done some art science work in New York, Daniel Cohn, told me about Jurassic a while back, and then he told me in particular about the scientific delirium madness, um, I guess one month residency. And uh, yeah, he and I had a conversation about what it is or what it might be, and, and he, I think he had been here before. Um, and so he basically encouraged me to apply. And uh, Seba and I, Sebastian, Seba and I, at the time were, um, were just finishing the Charango concerto that we were working on. Um, and it was a concerto that uh, Seba and a conductor and a pianist commissioned for me to compose. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a concerto that was based on the fundamental laws of physics. Um, and it was a concerto for charango and orchestra, and charango is a small uh, South American instrument that Seba plays. So it made sense to kind of expand on that project. Um, and also we were working on this other embodied learning of astronomy project and seemed like there's so many variables floating that it would be great to have a month to just ex expand them further and see what else uh, can, can come up from the things that we've started. And then I told Seba about it, and... And we applied. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we didn't, we actually didn't take a look at each other's um, applications. We wrote things separately, okay. uh, kind of guessing what the other person was, was probably saying, and I think it worked out. Um, so yeah, the main, the main idea was, it was to come here to work on that concerto based on the fundamental laws of nature that we use, I particularly use a lot in my, in my work to study um, planets and stars. And we were in Sweden, at, in the middle of a forest at a, the house of a cousin that I have there. And uh, we just went through the equations, like hard on the um, Lagrangian mechanics that can uh, you can, from which you can derive these fundamental laws and the symmetries that they represent, and all the like details in the in the math. That is something that Annie is very interested on. So it was mainly seeping into the fundamental laws from the math and historical perspective as well. And maybe to clarify, the fundamental laws being conservation laws conservation of energy, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of mass, that mathematically, since early 20th century, have been formalized to be um, symmetry equations. They're, they're understood in, in, in algebraically, they're understood as symmetries. Um, so uh, uh, the, the interesting thing to seep into was to sort of how I, al I always use the word underneathness <laughs> to say that, you know, for somebody who's working, for example, in protoplanetary disks that mm -hmm. Seba does, um, these conservation laws expressed mathematically and used mathematically are in absolutely everything. Every simulation, every um, kind of new theoretical proposition, every interpretation of data, and they're taken, they're you know, people don't talk about them very much anymore, but there's sort of this, this underneathness. There's this kind of fabric of, of um, mathematical intuition at this point about how to formulate questions and how to work with them. So both in the embodied learning of physics project and the, the Charango Concerto, what we wanted to do was somehow expose that, right? Because when people kind of present works about science, it's usually already the kind of the, the product oriented, like the really beautiful, you know, um, photo of that nebula or the really beautiful formation of that uh, protein structure or something. But, but the, the process that the scientist goes through that has these intuitions about these mathematical symmetries really is, is foundational to, um, to how these ideas are formed, how they're discussed. You know, if I use the word entanglement, what does somebody else understand about what I mean? And if that somebody else is working in uh, quantum information theory, they have a mathematical underneathness <laughs> with which we're using that word. So 
that was kind of the the idea and the motivation and how that got manifested in the concerto um, is of course metaphorical it isn't going to be explicit though there there are um, sort of graphic parts to the score that try to engage the reading of the score to get at this intuition of symmetry. The second movement of the concerto ideally will include will include um, more embodied knowledge of the instrument and your own the player's body and some movement as well in 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 the piece. Um, so we wanted to add that dimension to what we already had, which was this first movement based on the fundamental laws, the conservation uh, of different qu physical quantities. We wanted to take that to the body, like what's the, um, um, how is your body involved in the, in the process there? So there's been a lot of um, embodied practice done at the dance studio and also trying to understand in my, in my personal uh, process at least, trying to understand my connection through my body with the instrument. Can you describe, what, what does Torengo mean? Oh, we should just, we should have brought it. We should have brought it. It's an instrument. <laughs> it's, an okay. instrument. it's an instrument. Sorry. She said that earlier. It's, I, I, a, I it's a musical instrument from South America that carries a lot of um, history. It's from the Andes. It's from the Atacama Desert up, uh, the place where most of the astronomical observations have been done in, in Latin America in, from the old indigenous civilizations there, the Inca, the Atacameños, the Diaguitas, they were all you know, looking at the sky using the horizon as their um, first instrumentation for astronomical observation. And now the m more modern telescopes, radio telescopes that we have there. So the Charango inhabits the same land and it comes from there. And it, it also is a very versatile instrument. Maybe you want to say something more about the musicality, uh, the potential of the charango. Of the charango. Yeah, it's a very special instrument. I it hasn't. Uh, should I answer this or no? Okay. Um, it hasn't been involved very much in the kind of Western European orchestra. Um, there have been a couple of pieces written for it, but. They're, they're for the most part um, kind of expanding on an already existing folkloric harmonic structure of the instrument. Um, it's exceptionally bright. For me, it's kind of like the violin of the plucked string family. It's, uh, it's very small. Um, it has doubled five double strings, so 10 strings altogether, and tuned naturally to uh, an A minor seventh chord um, in just the open string tuning. And the kind of the traditional technique around playing it is is very wind-like, like it resembles sort of the environment where it comes from. And there's something also about, um, as Sebo was saying, uh, that the place where that instrument comes from has a presently kind of layered um, historicity of being the place for these for the the fanciest telescopes in the world, um, as well as. Uh, this rich tradition of Atacameñas and their uh, kind of cosmic interpretations and their... Um... The way Jurassi works of having these opportunities to share spaces with other scientists or artists and, and, and having dinner every day and getting together and, and talking, it's been, it's been really remarkable, it's been amazing. Um, it has have uh, it has had an, an effect on me um, just inspirational effect I mean the people there talk about so many fantastic interesting things and they are all so honest and transparent and down to earth and, and, and just beautiful humans that you just want to do what they're doing and <laughs> I want to write now I want to <laughs> I want to try poetry, uh, although I'm really bad at it. Um, I just want to paint. We, we made some um, tempera together okay. as well, with uh, trying different uh, 
trying different materials, um, substances to make paint and try to do an installation in the premises. Of Gerasi. We invited Dasha, who's a dancer, to come here and work with us. And the embodied, a lot of the embodied kind of experiments, for example, Seba, um, both of us, uh, playing the charango and kind of feeling small shifts in weight and, and kind of familiarizing ourselves with gravity, not just as we, you know, walk, but um, as we have this added object that's also kind of lopsided and weird. So that was a really... Um, fascinating development that's definitely a part of the second movement of the Charango Concerto. Then also during these improvisatory practices, uh, like for example the installation here, um, it was something we had thought about having talked about kind of the fundamental and determinacy in quantum mechanics, but then also Hideo who pulled out the loom, um, he's a quantum physicist and it's sort of just happened to kind of connect the piano strings to the strings of the loom and it became kind of a physical and a metaphorical connection. Um, and then with David, who's a um, bioscientist, biochemist, um, who makes these beautiful watercolor paintings. He'll talk probably about his work, but uh, we did an embodied learning experiment where we took uh, bacterial DNA replication and kind of talked with him a lot about you know, what are the kind of difficulties in communicating, not just what this information is, but what are the unknowns, and how can we use sort of knowledge of the body to investigate those unknowns, structure the improvisation in, in a, a coherent and an interesting way and get at those questions. So we did an experiment kind of inviting everybody to, to participate in this DNA replication in the dance studio, um, which was really great. And then following our I, I, I started making kind of these ward scores that I guess could read like poems, but they're really like scores for improvisation um, in words. Uh, and text scores has been a thing composers have worked with a lot and I've worked with a little bit, but it was interesting how it came out of, um, it came out of a lot of conversation, a lot of language was borrowed from different people. And then Eleanor was really great in hosting this writing workshop and, and then giving me feedback on some of these scores. Um, so I'm not sure if any text events will make it into the concerto. Of course, if they do, they'll have to be in Spanish, which will be a whole different beast, because <laughs> mm -hmm. the orchestra that will play the concerto is based in Chile. Um, but yeah, it's been really, really great having these inspirations from, um, on the one hand, very different people, but on the other hand, they felt, to me, it felt like there was a sameness about caring, um, caring about a certain space in between <laughs> these very seemingly distinct, but somehow intuitively similar threads. In the immediate future or nearby future is the um, recording of the Chenango Concerto. We have a grant to do a professional recording down in Chile with an orchestra. Um, so that's one of the next things that are, is gonna, are, are gonna happen. Um, from the science point of view, I just continue doing my scientific work, and but I wanted to have a slightly different flavor. Like one of the, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but one of the um, goals or I don't know aims I had before coming here was to try to do this, not leaving my role as a scientist and becoming like a, an artist type person, but be both. So I have continued writing a paper while I'm here, trying to really inhabit both worlds at the same time and not, you know, uh, swap from one to the, like change from one to the other. Um, so for me, it's, the next thing is try to maintain maintain that, you know, keep thinking of making sculptures or, 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 or doing more creative, uh, like a, like a, more extended creativeness um, in my scientific uh, environment? Um, for me, I think, so I'm in, I'm in the process of finishing my PhD, and it's, um, it's in history and philosophy of science and critical media practice, and I've been kind of trying to figure out ways of 
how to combine the two. Um, and this, I think, actually was really helpful, this whole experience, um, zooming in on um, wanting to say something about how art science isn't really a connection between the arts and the sciences. It's really a connection about human sciences and hard sciences or physical sciences or natural sciences. And then the artistic practice is, is an absolute necessity to weave a space between the two. Um, and so I think sort of as a, um, as an academic, <laughs> I guess, or a writer, um, I think that's something I'd really like to zoom in on and, and be able to kind of state and maybe even um, suggest that as a direction for art science work to really take uh, really, really substantial amounts of literature in the social sciences that kind of have an experimental flavor and substantial amount of clearly embedded history that we have of the natural sciences and, and really present kind of through this experience too of how is it that artistic practice is an absolutely necessary variable to weave between the two because otherwise People will continue to use the word entanglement and often completely misunderstand each other. Um, so that's that's kind of a, I see, yeah, it, this experience definitely helped me even put that into words and be able to say, okay, that's a thing that needs to be said and I think I, I'm pretty well equipped to say it. Um, as a composer, I think uh, working so much with the body and having so many people around who are so interested in the body, even if they're not like dancers or choreographers, um, just reinforces the, the embodied, um, that embodied knowing is an absolute necessity, an absolute like crucial variable to address in all of these collaborations. Um, and even, you know, stating that I'm a composer who works with bodies where embodied knowing that generates sound is integral to my process as a composer. I feel, I guess I feel more um, confident in stating that and more kind of assertive and yeah, that's kind of gonna be the genre, what, I don't know if that's a genre, but it's, it's gonna be a way in which I, I will continue to compose and explore sound and, 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 um, and also here I've been recording a lot of sounds. If, uh, Rayo has been making fun of me, but I've been kind of talking to all the animals almost every day. Um, and, and integrating the field recording uh, and the different, because we spent a lot of time exploring rhythm, um, polyrhythm, and how more steady rhythm emerges out of it, how it can go into a completely arrhythmic uh, soundscape. And actually this place is incredible because in the 24, hours a day, you have all different flavors of rhythmicity, arrhythmicity, polyrhythmicity. Um, and so I, I think also between, you know, reinstating myself as a composer, someone who will really insist on using bodies to generate sound, as well as field recordings of natural rhythms, um, how they can kind of be combined in my, in my, what will probably be a sonic output, but necessary to the process.